Floor Covering Association, and thank you for joining us for this inaugural episode of A Leader's Journey. This is a, a goal of mine is to help us discover what makes great leaders in our industry tick and how we can apply their success to our lives. I wanted to share with you some information about our guest of honor today, but before doing that, I just want to remind you that at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A section and you can go down there if you want to ask additional questions. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. I've also had numerous calls asking if we are recording this. And yes, we are recording it. This will be available on the WFCA.org website by tomorrow. So without further ado, let me tell you that our guest of honor today is none other than the co-CEO of CCA Global, Howard Brodsky. At least that's how you know him. But in doing my research on Howard, I, I can tell you he is so much more. Um, in fact, in, in researching him in preparation, I think I could spend the entire hour today doing nothing but talking about his accomplishments and accolades, but he wouldn't enjoy that and I wouldn't do that to you either. Let me share with you a little bit of background on him and then we're gonna turn this into a conversation format. Howard grew up in Manchester, New Hampshire. He attended Wesleyan University in Connecticut. He graduated with a degree in economics. After graduating, he joined the family business, Dean's Carpet in Manchester, New Hampshire, where he became the president. And in 1980, he helped create the American Floor Covering Association. That's important to me because the American Floor Covering Association merged with another organization called the Western Floor Covering Association to create the World Floor Covering Association, of which I am blessed to be the CEO. In 1984, Howard and his friend Alan Greenberg, who was also in the floor covering business, created the company CCA Global Partners and launched Carpet One Floor and Home as its first business. Initially, there were about 13 Carpet One Floor and Home stores. Now the chain has well over a thousand stores. And Howard Brodsky and Alan Greenberg founded the CCA Global Partners as a cooperative. And we'll talk more about cooperatives with Howard a little bit later. Soon they expanded from carpet into many other retail sectors. Today, and get this, CCA Global Partners is comprised of some 15 companies with annual sales of over 10 billion. That's with a B. Uh, current divisions of CCA Global Partners, some of which you'll be familiar with, Carpet One Floor at Home, Floor in America, Floor in Canada, the Floor Trader International Design Guild, ProSource. You may not be as familiar with Lighting One and the Viking Cooperative. Between those, they total about 3,300 retail locations in the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The newest company divisions are CCA for Social Good, which serves over 6,500 U.S. child care centers and 1,600 nonprofits. Biz Unite, which provides business services for over a half million independent businesses, including members of the WFCA. If you're not using Biz Unite, you're probably spending more than you ought to. We hope you'll take advantage of that resource. Uh, CCA Sports Retail Services, which helps independent fitness and ski stores compete with national chains. And Inovia Community Management Cooperative, which is a cooperative of homeowner associations and management companies across North America. Howard's also the chairman of Cooperatives for a Better World, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that aims to spread the cooperative message throughout the world. Uh, Cooperatives for a Better World focuses on the positive impact the cooperative business model can have on local, national, and global organizations. Howard, uh, in his free time, which you know, I don't know how he finds that, but he speaks and writes on various topics related to business practice. He's been a keynote speaker at the Harvard Business School the Better Business Bureau Torch Awards, and has been a featured speaker at TEDx, which I know many of you are familiar with, and many major entrepreneurial events. In 2015, Howard, along with co-author Dustin S. Klein, published a book called The Unexpected, Breakthrough Strategies to Supercharge Your Business and Earn Loyal Customers for Life. I reread it in preparation for spending some time with Howard. It is a great book. It's a quick read, Lots of stories. If you're like me, my attention span doesn't allow me to dive deep without a story that keeps me engaged. These will have stories that you'll be telling for days on end. He's a founder of the Better Business Bureau of New Hampshire and chairman of that for over 18 years, founder of Social Entrepreneurship Student Leadership Program of New Hampshire. He has served as chairman of the Floor Covering Industry Foundation. Hopefully you're familiar with that, but a foundation that helps people that have worked at least five years or someone in their family has in the flooring industry that faced financial need because of catastrophic illness. And he was one of the founders that put that together, a great organization that we're very proud of. He serves on numerous boards, including the Southern New Hampshire University Board of Trustees. I had to put that there because many people don't realize it is one of the fastest growing universities in the world, certainly in the United States. And in his free time, 
Howard serves as a justice of the peace. He's performed over 31 wedding ceremonies and all of them are still together. There are a lot of people that wish they could say that. He's in the Entrepreneurial Hall of Fame. He's been inducted into the Cooperative Hall of Fame, certainly the World Floor Covering Association, the Flooring Industries Hall of Fame. He's a New Hampshire Business Leader of the Year. In 2019, he received the Global Leadership Award from the World Affairs Council. And this year he was named the Business Leader of the Decade. Wow. Uh, Howard, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you being our inaugural person to share your leadership practices. And I really want to find out what makes you tick. I'm going to start with a question that uh, I probably drive people nuts when I get on an airplane because I'm that guy that actually talks to you when you sit down, unless I'm just exhausted. One of the questions I often ask is I'll sit down and I'll say, so tell me your story. And so in the next few minutes, give us kind of an overview. I know I hit a lot of the highlights, but tell us who is Howard Brodsky? Thank you, Scott. First, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. I really do. I have just enormous respect for you and the World Floor Covering Association and what they do for independent family floor covering stores in the United States. So my story really, uh, I was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, my father was a Russian immigrant and uh, came over to Lowell, Massachusetts. And I have an older brother and sister. And when I was five years old, my father had a dream. And that, that dream was to have a family business. So, you know, he, coming from Russia, that, that was a big dream. And my father never went to high school. Um, you know, he never got a high school degree. And my mother was a pharmacist actually. Wow. And, um, we moved to Manchester and my father opened up a small floor covering store called Dean's Floor Covering. And I saw the pride he had in it, Scott. I mean, it was just, he had pride in that. That was his dream. That was his, my father, unfortunately, got cancer when I was about 11 years old and passed away when I was 13. Wow. And uh, my older brother and sister, who were much smarter and were, were very much into academics, uh, we had no interest and it was a small store. It was a two person store doing about $150,000 at the time. But at the age of 13, I turned to my mother and I said, that's what I want to do, mom. I said, I want to go over and take over the family business because I saw the pride. And my mother somehow listened to a 13 year old child and stepped in and ran it. She was never involved with the business. And you know, back actually that many years ago, there were very few women in the floor covering industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but my mother was very smart and was really my hero. And she stepped in and ran it. Now, I wasn't going to go to college, actually. I wanted from high school. I was worrying to just go into the business. And my sister, who was the, the, the wise one of our family, said to my mother, if Howard doesn't go to college, sell the business. So I went to college. <laughs> you know, I, I, I came back out of college. I said the business was doing, it was a two-person business, doing $150,000, $200,000 a year. And I, I loved it. Um, you know, I, I was just roaring to go when the minute I got back from college, um, and it, it grew over the years. Um, and probably a, a defining moment was when I was, uh, 27, there were a group of people that were trying to start a division of the, uh, National Home Furniture Association, a floor covering division, which eventually became the American Floor Covering Association. And. I somehow got involved with a small group of people that wanted to start it. And at one of the meetings, um, one of the board members said to me, I'm leaving a little early, Howard. And I said, where are you going? He said, well, I'm meeting my industrial psychologist. And I, my brother actually was a psychologist, is a psychologist. And I said, what's an industrial psychologist? He said, well, that helps me with the people and it helps me find great people and work with a team of good people. And I was fascinated with it, Scott. And the next morning, when I got home, I called this company, Nordley Wilson Industrial Psychologist, and this psychologist, Lester Tobias, came up and spent the day with me and said to me, you know, you can get as the best people you want in the whole country. I said, I'm running a floor covering store. What do you mean I can get? He said, I'm telling you, I can show you how you can do it. And so I proceeded to meet with him once a week for 14 months. Wow. And... That really was my insight into how to find great people. I almost lost the business because I was finding such great people. I wasn't paying the attention I should to the business, but um, it, it was a defining moment because 
that skill set really stayed with me. Of how do you find great people? What do you look for? Um, what do you, what are your limits? And you know how important is talent opposed to the experience and all the other things? How important is heart opposed to mind and strategic thinking and all the elements that go into it? Well, obviously you're limited. There's only so much you as a leader can do. So it depends greatly on the people that you surround yourself with. If you've got a great team, then obviously the leader begins to shine. Let me go back and ask Howard. Uh, I wonder if the death of your father forced you to have to grow up faster. Did you have to learn to lead earlier than most people do because of some of the hardship you faced? No question. Uh, and and the, a couple of reasons. As I said, I had an older brother and sister. My brother was five years older. My sister was two years older. And we were a very close family. Uh, my brother, he, he would tell you to this day, was somewhat immature. My mother put him in school early. He was very bright. And so she skipped a grade. So he, he actually graduated high school when he was 16, graduated college when he was 20, and got his doctorate degree by the time he was 23, 22. And, uh, but he was immature, you know, and, uh, and my sister was very much into education. She became a professor of medical school. And, and so it was my mother and myself. And I did, I had to grow up. I was the, I was, became sort of the man in the family at the age of 13. Wow. And that had a profound influence on my life. And um, so no question, your life changes. I, I think I had to become very mature, very, very quickly. So I know you said you came back and began to run it after you graduated from college, but were you working in it all of those years? I was, uh, I was. So and originally when my father first passed away, um, I said it was a two to three person business and there was one person that my mother was never in it. She actually gave to run, you know, he was gonna run the business, but we found out that he was also stealing money. It was a small business. So all of a sudden there was no money and my father, died when, when he was only 46. And as I said, he had left very little for us. Um, and, you know, so my mother went in and uh, because she knew that's what I wanted to do. But in the summertime and after school, that's, I would go into the business. Mm -hmm. I, ever, I would work in the business after school in the summertime. I played football in high school, but from high school, I'd walk from the football stadium back to the business. And, and it was sort of my mother, my mother and I were a team. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, at the time I, I did the same thing. My father opened a, a carpet manufacturing facility and I worked in it every summer. And at the time I resented it, but now I think of the life lessons I learned by having to learn a work ethic when I was younger. And a lot of people my age didn't have that. I mean, to me, I still get so much of my self-esteem from working. I love doing things and being able to check off the box. But I, is that you, Howard? I mean, do you, you feel like you're wired the same way? And, and as I ask that question, I also kind of wonder, how would you describe your leadership style? What would you say is your style of leadership? Well, I think it's inclusive, in, empowering. Um, my feeling is when you find really great people, and I think that's one of the things that's made CCA has had just outstanding, outstanding people. Um, I mean, I, you know, look at, at the heart and core of who we are. It's all people. You know, we're not, we don't manufacture anything. We don't distribute anything. It's all about our heart and our soul and our mind. So I think I've always said there are two types of people that I think succeed at CCA. You have to have a good heart and you have to have a good mind. So we have very bright people that really care. I mean, our company is very mission orientated to making our members uh, the, of all types of industries successful. So they, they care. And I, I think my, I think a couple of things, you know, I try not to, I'm not a person that over controls. I believe if you have really talented people, some ways I always say, I want to act like a lighthouse. I can tell you where the rocks are buried and I don't want to steer your ship, but I want to make sure you know where the clear path is. Um, and I think it's also, to try to uh, empower people and do everything you can to make them as, you know, as good as they can become in an environment that they really enjoy. You know, I think, look, at, we spend more time at work than we do at home normally. Now with COVID, we spend more time at home, no question, but in normal times, 
And I think we're very proud of you. We've been the best, one of the best companies to work for for five years in a row. And there's a culture uh, that we care about them as people. And I do, you know, I really, I truly love the people I work with. I yeah. love what we do as a company, you know, the, and have a great passion for it. And what makes that tick is that we have great, great people. And um, I think if you find them, then just give them the tools to succeed. Give them the vision and the tools to succeed. And um, I think that's you know one of the keys. If you, if you spend enough time hiring the right people, you gotta be committed to them. Yeah, so if you're gonna invest your time on the front side, it's a way to do it. Invest in finding the right people. I find a lot of leaders that aren't willing to relinquish control and really they call themselves leaders, but they're actually managers because they're managing every step of the process and they don't have any time to create a vision for where the organization is going to go. When I'm on your campus, it feels like a family. Your people, I would say they get to come to work. They don't, they don't look like people that had to come to work. And I was going to note the fact that you've been recognized so many times as the business of the year, the place to work because you've created that atmosphere up there. No, I think that's, I think that's really important that, uh, look at, I've always said, you know, people are very conscientious. They, if they care about what they do, let them also enjoy what they do uh, in a way that, you know, um, is very good. And, you know, and I, as you know, you know, when I founded the company with Alan Greenberg and Alan, I were, you know, uh, we're very, very close friends. Um, matter of fact, Alan and I, in the days of the Ameri American Floor Cover Association, we were two of the co-founders of that. Wow. And then Alan became president of it. And then I became president of it. And, um, you know, and I'm not sure if you know the story. The first thing Alan and I really did together was uh, we were trying to enlarge the amount of sales in the industry. The, the industry for years and years have talked about how do you raise everybody up? How do you become like the milk, you know, like gut milk? Yeah. 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 And so Alan and I took it on and we said, well, you know something? We think we could raise money by every manufacturer to put a little money into a national fund. We could raise the awareness for floor covering and carpeting was mostly at the time and said, everybody's going to rise up because the industry will do more. And so we had a thing we called the billion dollar carpet sale. Our goal was to do a billion dollars in 10 days in the industry. And so Al and I were co-chairman of it. And we went to visit the ad agency, it was Bozell ad agency in New York. We did the milk commercial. And we said to them, how much money is it gonna to take to do it? And they said about $70 million. Um, now this was many years ago, so it's a lot more today. And Al and I were in phase and we had this whole plan that each manufacturer would give so much per pound, you know, two cents, three cents per pound. And we had it all figured out and we met with all the manufacturers and we wanted to raise about $60 million. And after about six months, we had raised 250,000. We were, we were $59,750,000 short. And Al and I looked at each other and said, this is not a good thing. We're, we're co-chairman of this. And we almost, we said, what are we gonna do? And so we really looked at another way. And we said, look at the powers in the local dealer. We need to get them to market. And so we took the $250,000. We hired a very small PR agency and we did a national sweepstakes where we had six cars, six trips to Hawaii, and we were doing a national sweepstakes and our goal was to sign up the dealers. And we, then we went to every major newspaper in the country and said, look at, if you put a 30 page insert in, do 15 pages on the beauty of carpet and why flooring is wonderful and all the things. And we'll get 15 pages of advertising. Now we had no money. We had, <laughs> this was gonna have to come from a local basis. And uh, so we got inserts down to every major newspaper in the country we wow. went to the mills and said we want you to sign up your deal it was a 79 dollar kit sign up and we got i think at the time i think we got like five thousand or six thousand dealers to sign up for 79 dollars and then we had the 10-day period now we didn't know what was going to happen because 
It wasn't our money. So we told all the dealers, look, we want you to advertise in the 10 day period and newspapers went to the local dealers. And um, the 10 day came and it was an enormous success. It was wow. in all indications we hit our numbers and it was the first thing that Alan and I ever did together. So was that kind of the catalyst that got you guys working together that became CCA Global? Yeah, Scott, it was. And you know what we realized? The power wasn't up here. The power was in, dis in a distributed network. It was at the local level. Yeah. What you had to do is how do you harness that power that's sitting here at the local level of all these dealers across the country? Yeah. And that's when Alan and I sort of said, you know, if we don't do something in our industry, we're going to be like, you know, very much like the home, the home center industry where Depot was taking over everybody and Lowe's was taking over everybody and so many other industries that were just fading by the sideline. And, you know, we said, and we knew a lot of dealers, you know, we knew a lot of people from being president of the trade association yeah. and we cared. And, um, but we weren't sure what we were going to do. Was it going to be a franchise? And we had never heard of a cooperative. Um, and so when you first heard of a cooperative, Howard, why did that appeal to you? Well, what happened was actually, um, we had a very close friend, Shelly London, who was the lobbyist for the floor covering industry. He represented the floor covering industry for many years, also the hardware industry. And we told Shelly what we we're thinking of doing. And he said, you know, I have a very close friend that is the CEO of True Serve Hardware Stores uh, in Butler, Pennsylvania. And he said, I think you guys could should go out and meet with him. And we knew very little about a cooperative. I mean, very little, almost nothing about a cooperative. And Al and I flew down to Butler, Pennsylvania. We spent the day with the CEO, who was a gentleman named Larry Zephus. And he was the nicest man. And he told us, we spent eight hours with him. He gave us his full day's time. Wow. And we said, boy, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have a cooperative because these were our friends that we wanted to join. These weren't like, and we said, you know something, a cooperative, it's all about what's in it for everyone, not what's in it for us. Yeah. And we didn't want something where somebody's going to say, well, look at you guys are going to make a fortune off us and you're going to do this. And, and we just like the whole cooperative principle of what it was, shared ownership, shared opportunity, shared wealth. And so <clears throat> um, we walked out of there and Al and I looked at each other and said, we're signing a cooperative. And wow. we called 13 of our closest friends. We developed a little business plan. And this is 36 years ago. Wow. Um, developed a business plan. And I remember we brought 13 very close friends into Atlanta. And I'll never forget, it was at the Hilton. It was, it was a, the heat went off that day and we were doing presentations, it was freezing, which normally doesn't happen in Atlanta. And uh, we had a flip chart. There wasn't, you know, we had a flip chart and we said to people, if you like the concept, join now. If you don't, if you don't want it at the end of 90 days, just walk away. And so we had 13 very close friends. Actually, five of them had been previous presidents of the American Floor Covering Association. Wow. So they knew a lot of people. And we started off with 13 people, Scott. How did the industry respond, Howard, when you came together? Because obviously your voice is louder now. You've combined with other right. people. You've got more, more power. How was well, the I think they it was not in, looked at as an endearing thing in the beginning uh because they said well my gosh you're going to take our most profitable customer and try to bring scale to them and so you know now the industry at the time was very 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 fragmented you yes. know there were, there were probably 350 mills which played to our favor so yes a lot of mills wouldn't sell us because they didn't like the idea uh, but we had some friends in the industry because i had our store was fairly large. Allen had a store in St. Louis was fairly large. And um, we had some very, very close friends in the industry that really helped us with being initial suppliers. And it was interesting. And our original goal when we started it was we were going to have 300 stores. And I don't know where we came up with 300 stores, Scott, but that was our original goal was 300 stores. And from the 300 stores, after about two years, um, we had like 125, 130, and we were growing faster than we thought. Now, we said, how did we come up with 300 stores? And said, we both looked at it and said, we don't know. You know, it wasn't any magic plan. And we said, how many should we have? And 
at the time, Cadillac, this was again, 35 years ago, Mercedes and BMW were not as prominent in the United States. Cadillac was considered a lot of Chevy dealers, a lot of Ford dealers, but Cadillac was considered like the premier dealership. And so Alan and I walked into a Cadillac dealership and said, uh, you know, we're just curious, how many dealers do you have across the country? And he said, we have about a thousand. Alan and I walked out and said, that's what we need is a thousand carpet one stores. <laughs> and today we have a thousand stores. So it, it was, uh, that was our marketing plan. It was a lot of it was just gut and, you know, and instinct, I think, Scott. So let me go back and fill in a blank, Howard, because you just said something that might have some of the people questioning. You had originally said that Dean's carpet was only 150,000. You didn't yeah. take it to the end of that. Because then you said you had buying power. So tell them what happened with Dean's and how big it was. Well, so a couple of things, and it really is a big part of my life. Uh, so Dean's grew. I was fairly always comfortable with marketing and sales. And um, we actually grew to five stores. Wow. And we're doing at the time maybe about six, seven million. That was back 35 years ago, 40 years ago, actually 40 years ago. And uh, I told you about the industrial psychologist. So I proceeded to be hiring all these amazing people. I mean, I was amazed by him and he was right. I mean, if I did the right things and looked for the right people, I, I was hiring a team of people. We were going to expand to 20 stores. And I was hiring incredible people. And my mother during this time who was still involved, sort of on the side a little bit, my mother was very smart and she kept on saying to me, you know, all these, they don't know what they're doing all these people. And I'd say to my mother, mom, look at, they're really, really smart. She said, they might be really, really smart, but they have no idea what they're doing. And, uh, and I would say, and I was young and, you know, motivated. And I said, and I had this big plan of what are we going to do? And, and slowly all this supplier started to call me up and said, you know, Howard, you, um, your bills are passed due. And Lester, I told the, the psychologist, come in every week and we got this, I had a group controller and, you know, very talented people. And um, he said, you got to give control to your people. Don't put that in Chuck's hand. You know, and this, and he said, everything's in place. He said, you got the greatest team that anybody could have ever assembled and this and that. And, and slowly the calls came more and more often, more and more often, Scott. And finally, uh, on a Sunday, I went into the, you know, Chuck, it was our controller office and I opened up a drawer and there was sitting there millions of dollars in unpaid bills. And I called him at his house and I said, Chuck, I'm in your office and maybe I shouldn't be in your office, but it's my company. And all these bills aren't paid. And he said, I didn't know how to tell you we're broke. Now there I was 27 years old, just turned 28. I had a two year old child and my wife was pregnant. Uh, it was a local family business. Um, I had called the accountants. They came in and they said, you are broke. And um, obviously earth shaking. Um, and, you know, I had to then to figure out what I was going to do. And at the time, the only option was to file for chapter 11 reorganization um, bankruptcy, of which I did. Uh, which was as humbling as a process. But I always say it was my MBA, but I, I then had to go tell my mother who kept the business running for me that we were gonna, we were almost out of business. And I'll never forget, I went to my mother's house and I told her what was happening. And she could have easily said, I told you so, because she told me so. She did tell me so for a year and she didn't, uh, Scott, she put her arms around me, gave me a big hug and said, you know, I love you. And that's the way you learn. And I always say, if she had not done that, I think I would have been so risk adverse from that point on. And a huge lesson in my life was, I think when people make the greatest mistakes, they need the greatest love. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's so easy. We all have children or friends or associates. Everybody's going to make mistakes. When they make terrible mistakes, they, they need love. They, they don't need to be told, I told you so. 
Um, and so my mother gave me a great lesson. And I think because of that, I never became risk adverse. I think otherwise I would have been, I would have hunkered down and I think been scared to do anything. But I, I wasn't. And, you know, we came out of it in record time, in a nor you know, in, which I didn't realize record time because, you know, somebody said, what was, what did it feel like? I said, it felt like being in a dumpster, on the bottom of the dumpster. And as you claw your way out and all the garbage, you just see light. They're dumping another truck on you, you know, and, uh, you know, it was a challenging uh, four or five months. It was without a question, it was challenging. Well, especially in a small town, because your reputation is everything. Oh, Scott, it, it was everything. But, you know, I had um, a close friend, Rick Meyer, who was much, quite a bit older, who was also on the board of the American Floor Company Association, was the president. And Rick never gave me money or anything, but boy, he became my mentor. And he just gave me advice. And so the business turned around very, very quickly. Um, you know, eventually I, he told me, shut down the little store. You know, I, we went to one big store um, and it eventually became a, a $12 million operation 40 years ago out of one location. Well, I'm glad you shared that story because I was about to ask you, it sounds like you and Alan are both everything's possible people <laughs> where you look at things and, and uh, was there ever a time when you just said, this isn't going to work, we can't do this? No, I think we were very, very committed. You know, in, in the early days, we ran it out of our own company. Um, so I ran it out of Dean's of Manchester. Alan ran out of parts of it out of Sun Carpet in St. Louis. And, uh, you know, I think the one thing we had then, and I hopefully I have now, is passion. We yeah. loved, we, Scott, we loved every minute of it. Early in the game, you know, I was young enough sometimes to work 24 hours. We went to convention. We would do the setup. We didn't have a convention company. You know, we were the convention company, um, you know, and then Sandy Michigan came on as head of the product. And but no, I mean, look at there were, there were like anything startup, there are bumps and things and things that happen. But I think we were so committed and saw such um, a future and realized the difference we could make to, to the industry. And for a lot of these people, you know, if they weren't our friends in the beginning, they were our friends soon. And I think one thing that happened early on, Scott, was about a year in, and we, we maybe not even quite, and we had about 26 stores that were signed up, mostly people we knew. And um, we, were, we were doing a presentation, and Alan, Sandy, and I were doing all the presentations. We're doing a presentation for a, a gentleman who had a big chain actually in, in Atlanta, had five store chain at the time was doing about 25 million total business, which is huge, huge. And we did the presentation and it was $13,000 a store to join back then. And we wanted, we needed volume to, you know, to tell the members that we, you know, the mills and stuff that we were in, and this was gonna be like a big thing. And so at the end of like a three hour presentation, he turned to us and he said, I'm in. And we wrote, sit down, wrote out a check for $65,000. Wow. And mind you, this is a long time ago. It was, it was big and we high fived each other and said, wow, we thought we were the greatest thing in the world. And then I'll never forget one of us, I think Sandy turned and said, you know, he has a bad reputation in the mills. And we said, uh-huh. And then one of us said, you know, he's not really the nicest person in the world. He said, mm-hmm. <laughs> we proceeded to talk about what we wanted as a member, we were in the first year of the operation. We said, you know, whoever we bring on is going to be who we are because we're cooperative. So the members we have is, is who, who, that's what we're going to be. Yeah, they define you. They're not honest. If we have people that aren't trustworthy, if we have people that aren't really respected in the industry, we won't be respected and we won't even like it. So we made a commitment to ourselves. We said, you know something, if we didn't want to bring somebody home and have dinner with them, we didn't want them to become part of the call. Mm. So we took the check, we put it in an envelope and we sent it back to him. Wow. Um, and I think in many ways, that was a defining moment of saying who we were as a company and, mm. and what we wanted as a company. 
Did you ever imagine in your wildest dreams how big it would get? No, I think what happened is at each stage, another door opened. So I would say, you know, we started with Carpenter One Floor and Home and it grew and it grew quite quickly. And then we, you know, we founded ProSource. We started ProSource from scratch because what we said is, well, we have a lot of deals in the market and boy, they could expand in their own market if they had another category and then so we did that and then you know uh flooring america went into bankruptcy and we saw the there were a lot of deals there that really could use a lot of help and we thought it was an opportunity but then you know after about six seven years what al and i realized was that more than being in the floor covering industry we we're in the business of saving family businesses in america mm. that it was more than that that our that the skill set of marketing and buying and technology and training, that was more than just in the floor covering industry. And also if we could develop some more, more sophisticated skill sets that helped the floor covering industry. So we slowly went into lighting business, the lighting retail stores. And then we went into a sports group with bike stores and ski stores. And then we went into community management company with you know, managing you know, condos and homeowners association across the country. Um, and then two major things happened. The Aspen Institute came to us from Washington, maybe about 12, 13 years ago and said, God, we, you know, we learned about you and we think your model would work in the nonprofit industry. And while I've been involved in nonprofits, I never really thought about it as part of our core competency. And so over a six month period, they brought in community health centers, um, theater groups, childcare centers, Wow. Every type of non mental health centers, every type of nonprofit you can imagine. And we presented to them and they came to us, Kirsten Moy, who was in charge at the time of scaling a nonprofit said, they all think what you're doing is perfect for the nonprofit industry because nonprofit in many ways are little cottage businesses. Mm -hmm. And the executive director is like the founder um, yeah. of a business, you know, without that executive director, whether it's a local theater or a local childcare center, it doesn't cook. That's and so I'm responsible for making it float. Right. So we went into the childcare world because it was such a need. And, you know, having kids to have the proper education at the early age is like critical. And upper, you know, if people are rich, they have great childcare centers, but there was tremendous pressure on below and turnover. And so today, actually, we have 21,000 childcare centers. Here. Wow. And uh, I think we're in 33 wow. states. And we're, we're proud of that. And we're very proud of what we, and then we had another vision night, which became, uh, you know, member solutions, uh, savings to member, it's gone through a couple of changes, but, uh, you know, we, we service almost a million family businesses with backroom services. Yeah, that's one of the we other co-ops, other associations. Yeah, that's one of the big things that we offer with WFCA is your vision night program that allows people to save money on a whole plethora of things that can benefit their business. and. Um, I, I love the concept, however, because what I hear you saying is the rising tide truly does raise all ships. I mean, if you can set a higher standard, everybody starts to, to try to focus on that as the new standard. And that's, that's what you've done, whether that was your intent or not, through all these years. Well, you know, originally when we started, Scott, we always said we weren't going to be just a buying group. That was never. We said, if we really want to affect the bottom line, it has to be buying, marketing, and management. Um, today I would push in, you know, technology, you know, but you need to service all of those because if you just did great buying, a lot of times people were selling it, they would buy it less and sell it for less, you know, or if they didn't know how to manage their company that was going out the back door by inefficiency. That's and, correct. And today you need the technology. So, and what I would say is the diversity of the business also gives us a real depth of management talent. So the sophistication and love that we have internally of marketing and training um, of a lot of the tools and technology has been permitted by having a breadth of companies and the breadth of executive talent that we would not have if we were just singularly focused. That's true. Flooring is our, look at, it's our core. But don't, you know, make no bones about it. It's our core businesses that we, we never want to lose sight of. Yeah. Well, the impact has been amazing. I, I, I want to research because we're limited on time. Uh, 
obviously somebody who's had a vision like you have and accomplished what you've accomplished. I'm hoping you can share with us where you see this industry going. In fact, Kathy Case sent me a question basically saying how the industry is changing in the blink of an eye. You've got 3D printers that are building houses now. Where do we expect this industry to go? What's your perspective on that? Well, first, I think floor covering retailers, independent retailers are the heart and core. You know, obviously Home Depot, Lowe's and Lumber Liquidators, um, for them, it's an aisle of goods. There's no passion for that business. There's no family owner of that business, even for them for the core. You know, there is, I believe, you know, the passion of a family business. I really do believe that family businesses are the fabric of our community, Scott. I mean, I, I started from my father when I was very young, but family businesses are the core. And all the members we serve, you know, the, their love of their community and what they do for the community. So I'd say this, that I understand that Home Depot and Lowe's and other liquidators, and, you know, floor decor all sell product. It's, they're just selling, you know, it's, it's a P&L. They don't own it. They, you know, their managers working somewhere. And, um, you know, the people that work in our stores and are your members, that's their life. Yeah. That's their passion. It's not, so I think we should never lose sight of that. That these are the people that, to me, that really count in our industry. But it's becoming, it's becoming much more and more sophisticated. It's becoming technology is driving everything today. Oh, yeah. And I think without scale, what I would say is this. Scale was important when we started. Scale is critical today. I don't know how somebody is going to prosper without scale. The, the tools that we have that we offer, I think being an independent is tough running your own business today. Filling up, are you buying the insurance right? Is the real estate lease right? Um, do I have all the right technology? Do, you know, the training of our staff, hiring people. You know, we have a very sophisticated hiring group now, but there are so many, so many pieces that I think you need scale. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think to get scale, I would say the best way to get scale is a cooperative because it doesn't take ownership from the individual. You know, I think the wonderful thing about our company is our goals are aligned. Everybody in that, our company goals are aligned because nobody, including me, owns a share of the company. Our members own the company. Mm -hmm. So we are only successful if they're successful. So there's no, it's to me, the cooperative structure is the best of both worlds because they own the company. It gives them scale and they don't lose their independence, but they get the scale they need to succeed. Yeah. When you talk about a cooperative, Howard, you don't even realize this happens, but your passion turns up. I mean, Keith, Keith Spano and I were exchanging uh, emails talking about your leadership style. And that's one of the things he said, as you note, Howard's passion about the cooperative and his focus on the members and how much it's all about the members having success. And that's what you just said. You only succeed when they succeed. Yeah. And I've seen the cooperative model, both in the United States and around the world, be so successful in so many industries. Look at Ace Hardware, Lando Lakes is a $40 billion cooperative. People don't realize the wow. size of cooperatives. You know, th there are a billion members of cooperatives around the world, a billion members. Um, it's 14% of the total gross national product of world economics. I mean, so it 14%. is 15, over 15%. Wow. Um, I think people don't realize the scale and both in the United States, you know, in the, in the United States, in the farming, I think it's 60% of all the farm goods are produced by a cooperative of some type or organic valley, cabbage cheese, I can go on and on, ocean spray are all cooperatives. Are they that, really? That we know. And so we've seen the power and that we see the empowerment it gives. And you know what I would just say is that it is, the, as I said, it is the best of both worlds of how you can give somebody power and scale and still maintain your family look, business and your community and your being part of the fabric of the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think it's, you know, I always say, I think people should be driven by moral compass. And I think I'm driven, I think our people are driven by a moral compass, Scott, of doing what's right. I know, you know, Rick, my co-CEO is just, who's incredible, Rick Bennett, who's just, you know, I mean, He's, he's an incredible leader, 
but I don't know how many meetings where you always, you know, says, we always do what's right. And I think it's a fabric of who we are. We, yeah. we do as a company what is right. Um, and I think having really talented people and doing what's right makes up a strong, strong organization. Yeah, and you guys have done an amazing job of that. How, what do you say to the people that aren't blessed enough to be part of the CCA? This is not a sales pitch for CCA. I just mean, what do you tell leaders that are wanting to do their best? What do those leaders need to do today? If you were to put that in a nutshell, maybe three or four things that if leaders really want to be successful, here are the things they need to do. Well, number one, I think you do need scale. So you got to figure out how to go to get scale. I think being alone, it's not, people, it's nothing with how do you get scale without losing your independence? Because I think business is going to, it is more sophisticated now. It's going to become more. And as the floor decors and everybody else in the world do, I mean, I know during the recession, Scott, you know, we lost very few members during the recession. And, uh, you know, they're saying that one out of every six businesses in general are going to go out during COVID. Um, we think we will maintain most. So, Number one, you need scale. Number two, you need great people. Spend up, spend the time up front to have an outstanding people and figure out how you're going to do that. And you know, set your goals and your sights high for that. Don't accept less than really great people because you know, if your company, every company is made up of people. If you accept somebody less than it's going to be outstanding, your company is going to be less than outstanding. Yeah. And, and then, you know, to me, your word has to be a bond. So always be trustworthy um, and transparent with everything you do, you know, because, you know, I always say, you know, you could lose money, you could lose a job, but never lose your reputation. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, fortunately, there's a movement towards local now during COVID. Yeah, so I think the local business is in a good place if they have the right pieces in place. You know, yeah. so I think there's much more movement towards people want to help their community. Yeah. Um, but that's why I think the best of both worlds is I'm local, I care, I'm part of the community, and I'm part of the largest buying group in the world to give you the lowest prices because there's that, there's that balance. Yes. Um, and then I think the other thing, just from a leadership standpoint, I think caring for people, that these aren't just instruments, you know, in any company, you know, they're not just tools to, to, to an end. You have to care about them as individuals. You have to care about their families. You have to care and set up a structure that can have them grow to be whatever they can grow to be. You know, you want an environment that enhances people's lives. Yeah, I don't want to segue too far from that. Those are amazing points, which, I, I, by the way, with your permission, I will be using again at some point. That, that really lays it out very succinctly. I want to go back and touch on the FCIF because you were one of the ones who had the vision to create that organization as well. And I know at one time we were one of three organizations of that kind in the world, Major League Baseball, Screen Actors Guild, and the Floor Covering Industry Foundation. What was the vision to create the FCIF? What was the driving factor? Obviously, your care for the people of the industry who had made our occupations possible. So first of all, I wasn't one of the original, original founders. Uh, I think uh, Larry Nagel was and Walter yep. Gottman from Karasin was. And I, I got, Alan and I got involved very, very early. Um, yep. And, and it, it really was stagnant for a while. And I think hopefully we helped generate a, a impetus and movement. But I think the... I think the original caring was that this is our industry. These are people we care about. These are the people we work with. If they have a critical illness and at times, whether it be cancer or you know, a debilitating illness of any type and financial needs, that's the last thing they need is to be financially troubled as well as have a critical illness in time. And we said, you know, that these are the people that need our resources. And so if we're doing well, let's help other people that aren't doing well. And as you said, Scott, I think we're only one of three industries that have a foundation for their own people. Mm -hmm. But I know, look, at I, I've been, I was fortunate to be chairman of the foundation for, I think, 15 years, a long yeah. time. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, I, and I've seen the work they've done. I've seen the stories. They're heartbreaking stories and also rewarding stories. I've seen the difference that checks has made to people of giving a monthly check or a six month check or paying for, you know, you know, a new car because they couldn't get to the hospital, paying for their medical services, paying for so many different things is just, it has touched their lives in a way that, boy, when you read that and you say, what's life about? Yeah. What the Floor Camera Industry Foundation is doing, Scott, is what life should be about, about us caring that the world is bigger than us individually, that it should be about we and not me. Well, Andrea, as you know, does a phenomenal job running oh. it. But I tell Andrea all the time, it's the feel-good part of my job. It's the one yeah. thing I know when I do it, I'm directly impacting somebody's life in a positive manner. It absolutely is. It's a, it's a wonderful. Yeah, because you and I can work for weeks and maybe not see anything happen. But you know when you're involved in that, you're impacting somebody today. I just want to encourage people that might be watching to spread the news. We, we want to help people that have need that have worked in the flooring industry four or five years or have a member of their family that has and we also would welcome your funding to so that we can do more good. So we we welcome you on both sides. I appreciate your leadership in that. And Larry Nagel, who's a, a dear friend to both of us, has Great been leader. amazing his leadership on that and helping us secure funding to keep that active and vibrant. Right. No, he's, he's, Larry's been outstanding. He has been. So I'm looking to see how if we have any questions, because I've got a few more and I don't want to take anybody else's space. So guys, I'll remind you, if you have any questions for Howard, put them at the bottom. If not, I'm going to continue on here with a couple more. Howard, I mentioned your book in the introduction, um, The Unexpected. I love it. I, again, I also said I've read it again in pre preparation for this. What was the motivation for the writing of the book? You know, what I really saw, so I was fortunate um, for many years uh, that I was a national judge for the Entrepreneur of the Year program. And that is, the for those that aren't familiar with it, it's like the Oscars of business in the world. Um, Ernst & Young puts it on. Well, they have regional winners and then they have a national winner that happens every year in California. And I became a national judge and at one point chairman of the national judging uh, in the consumer category. And so I got to see the stories of Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks, um, Arthur Blunt, the founder of Home Depot, mm. Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn. I would say almost every luminary of the business was a winner at some point of the Entrepreneur of the Year. And wow. having, I was doing that for almost seven years and it was fascinating to me, but I was studying what made them successful. And what I found was there were four characteristics of success for these unbelievable leaders. I mean, these were leaders changing and number one was, Scott, that they all wanted to change an industry. They didn't want to just, they didn't want to just grow. They didn't want to have a business just with a lot of volume. They wanted to restructure, change for the better an entire industry. Number two, they had enormous risk and tolerance for failure. They, the enormous tolerance for that. You know, Winston Churchill once said, success is going from failure to failure with great enthusiasm. Well, let me tell you, th these people followed Winston Churchill's model there. Um, third is, there was no peak when, you know, Howard Schultz in the first 10 years built 116 Starbucks. People didn't know it, it wasn't an overnight success. And it was the biggest chain in the country. Most people would have said, well, I'm in great shape, but in the next five years, he built 7,000. Wow. Um, and all of them, all of them, it wasn't about the numbers. There was no peak. When they reached a peak, it was they, were going, they went on to another peak to develop something else. They had another vision for what they were going to do. And the fourth and last one, which is where I found it, they all had an ability to deliver the unexpected. And I think it relates to anybody listening in, Scott. And what does that mean? Well, I think... You know, for a lot of times it was like world-class service is what everybody has to deliver. I think world-class service now is the price of entry. Yeah. And I think if you can't do world-class service, then you don't even, you're not even in the game. Mm -hmm. But I believe if you really want to stand out, it's more. And I, I have many examples. I mean, I'll show you, you know, that, that Zappos, which everybody knows, they eventually got bought by uh, Amazon. 
But Zappos would, you know, ship like five, you know, six shoes to women and um, you know, men, but mostly women bought them. And you had like 30 or 60 days to then return them if you didn't want to return them. They were like the leader in, in service and everything else. And there was a woman in Pittsburgh who had bought like eight shoes and her mother got very ill with cancer. And she was supposed to return them, never returned them. Um, after about eight months, her mother passed away and she finally was getting down to things. She said, oh, I know they're probably not gonna take the shoes back. And she called Zappos and said, you know, this is my story and my mother passed away. And they said, here's your FedEx number, ship them back. Now I put that, that's world-class service. The next day she got flowers from Zappos with a card of sympathy about her mother. Wow. She told a zillion friends what it was. There was Nordstrom's once that somebody went to Nordstrom's and Nordstrom is known for great service. How did they become the reason? A gentleman came in with four tires to Nordstrom and he said, I'd like to return the tires. And the gentleman said, okay. Um, and he said, how much did you pay? And they didn't ask why. Nordstrom's has a policy of not asking. And they said, I paid $800 and Nordstrom gave a credit for $800. And the gentleman walked out, except Nordstrom's never sold tires. <laughs> um, and Nordstrom's probably got from that one event $10 million worth of marketing. I mean, it was just incredible. And all these things really add up that if you really want to distinguish yourself, you know, it's, it's how the Rich Cotton bid, bid, built their brand. Mm -hmm. it, it's how companies, but I say this, small companies can do it better than big companies because you can be more nimble. That yeah. how do you do something ex unexpected um, in, in anything? I always say, you know, if you go to eat at a restaurant and you ate at the same restaurant last week, you got the same food. On social media, you don't put them and say, oh, I just want to tell you, I got the same food as last week. You know, unless somebody has something ex unexpected happen. And, you know, my original story with it was from a Jet Blue story. If we have time, do we have to tell Oh, minutes? please, please. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll so, go. I love this. Yeah, so I'm going to say, so the original thing that really caught my eye was the of writing the book beside the entrepreneur of the years was that we had a convention in Long Beach quite a few years ago in Long Beach, California. And Boston, the only nonstop flight to Long Beach was JetBlue. So we had a group in the morning of 30, 40 people going. And we had another group in the afternoon from the New Hampshire office going Boston to Long Beach nonstop with JetBlue in the afternoon. And I was in the morning group. And I always carried my own food anyways. But as I was getting on, the steward said to me, boy, I hope you got enough food. It's going to be a long flight. And I said, oh, I, I always bring enough food. And about an hour into the flight, the pilot came on. He said, you know, I, I have some not great news. He said, you know, as you can see, we're full. So, and we're going to California. We need a full fuel tank and we're full. And there are enormous headwinds at 200 miles an hour. He said, we cannot make it nonstop. And he said, we're going to have to stop at Minneapolis. But he said, look, at, uh, I know nobody expected it. I'm going to give you a free movie to watch. You know, JetBlue had the movies and I'm going to give you a $25 credit. I put that world-class service. The afternoon group came on. They got on the plane. Stewardess made a couple of comments. A couple people might be a long flight. About an hour, an hour and a half into the flight, the pilot comes on, different pilot, obviously, and said, you know, we have, they had the same headwinds. He said, we have headwinds of 200 miles an hour. He says, as you can see, the plane is full. He said, we cannot make it to Long Beach non nonstop today. And he said, we've been rerouted to Denver and we'll refuel in Denver. And he said, instead of a six and a half hour flight, it's gonna be maybe eight and a half to nine hours. Mm -hmm. And everybody went, mm, you know, and, and, and then he came on about 20 minutes later. He said, no, I've been thinking about it. He said, if I was going on that kind of flight, didn't expect it, I'd be quite upset and, also made me very hungry. And he said, we go to Denver a lot and there's a pizza hut, maybe a mile from the airport that I know very well. And he said, so I radioed in for the pizza hut and I'm getting 20 pizzas of four different kinds. I'm getting some French fries, I'm getting drinks and they're gonna bring it to the plane. We can't get off the plane because they're traffic control, but they're gonna bring it to the plane and the plane burst out in applause, Scott. <laughs> um, now what's interesting is we got to convention Nobody from the first group said anything except it was a long flight. Oh, it was a full day. 
The second group, all they talked about was the pilot got him pizza. And, you know, the next day in USA Today, in the money section, was an article on it. Wow. And what it really showed me is, if you want to succeed today, empower your people to do the unexpected. Empower them. And by the way, Scott, I think that works in business. It works in, with your help, with, it, with associates, because everybody expects a good wage and benefits. Do something unexpected for them if you want them to be outstanding. And I think it works at home. You know, I always say, boy, if, you know, if you give your wife a gift on your birthday or your better half on your birthday, you don't get a lot of credit unless it's because they expect it. Give them a gift or somebody else a gift on a day that's nothing with a special note on it. That's when people remember. So I think the unexpected can be a real separator for people, Scott. Well, and today, Howard, as you know, the opportunity for any event to go viral. You see something like that, social media takes it and runs for you. You can't buy that type of advertising. That that does the work for you. And that's, that's what we are look at Social media controls us today. And if you want to set up your reputation, you do the unexpected. You you other wonderful thing about unexpected, other people tell your story. And that's what's the credible story. When other people tell your story, it becomes really credible and really people want to do business with you. Wow. Hey, Howard, thank you so much. We, we are out of time. This has been, I could go for hours. I just love talking to you. I respect you so much and have for years. And thank you again for uh, agreeing to be our first person to go through this series, A Leader's Journey. I love what you've shared with us personally and professionally and the experiences you've learned both ways. I want to tell the people that are viewing with us that uh, in, in two weeks on November 5th at this same time, Pete Dosh from U.S. Forest Shaw Industries, um, Creator Cortec will be our guest and he'll be sharing. Also to remind you that uh, if you're wanting to see this again, or please share the news about this hour we spent together with Howard, it will be available at WFCA.org tomorrow. So please, uh, please share that news and let people know and uh, free access to that. I uh, hope that you can use it and apply it to your lives. Howard, you're an amazing man. I hope you continue to do good and I, I look forward to seeing uh, what is what is next for you? My pleasure to be with you, Scott. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you.